My name is Sabah Malik, and I'm very happy to be here with Rachel Ivey and Courtney Mitchell. And we are going to be talking to you about the subjects on misogyny and ecocide and how they are connected. So with that, we'll go to the first slide. And this is the definition of misogyny. So it comes from the Greek word messiah, which means to hate, and then gyne, which is woman. And misogyny is a cultural attitude of hatred for females because they are female. It's a central part of sexist prejudice and the ideology of rape culture. And so, for that reason, it's an important basis for the oppression of females in male-dominated societies. And one of its functions is, is to, it's used to justify and rationalize male supremacy. So, today most cultures worldwide are patriarchal or they're male-dominated. And what that means is that male supremacist cultures, they systematically extract resources like labor, sexual gratification, and reproduction from female people. Now, rape cultures are constructed around the breaking of women's boundaries, physically and psychologically, through violation and extraction. Now, ecocide. Ecocide is the killing of ecological communities, and that commands its own ideology. This is the ideology of progress, of human ownership, and of human domination over the Earth. This is the myth of infinite growth on a finite planet. And the ideology of ecocide is regarded by industrialized people today as a dogma. And it's that ideology which is used by extractive cultures to justify the wholesale destruction of ecological communities and of non-industrialized indigenous human cultures that depend on them. The ideology of extraction fuels our food, our fuel, and our wars. Ecocide also requires rape culture. It's not only breaking the boundaries of women and girls, but of non-humans, of people of color, of the land, the oceans, the air, and the atom. So the violation of ecocide and of misogyny and of male supremacy is not violation for its own sake. All oppression is in the service of resource extraction. If members of a society have an ideology of hatred towards women and girls, they are a lot less likely to resist or even to notice as the bodies of the female population are systematically mined for labor, economic resources, reproduction, and sex by males in this culture. So some examples of this are the fact that women are roughly half the population, yet they are 70% of the world's poor. So in a male supremacy, male individuals are more likely to have their basic needs met, um, they're more likely to attain positions of power, but they're more likely to get those needs met by depriving women of those resources, and that's an example um, of this. So women produce half of the world's food, yet they own only 1% of the world's property. So this is extraction of both economic resources, where women are vastly underrepresented, and labor. Um, women are doing more labor by a large margin globally and not being compensated for that, so that is extraction. Um, females represent 55% of the estimated 20.9 million victims of forced labor worldwide, and 98% of the estimated 4.5 million for forced into sexual slavery. Um, this clearly is both extraction of labor and of sexual gratification. Um, and in many cases, those are considered one and the same. Upwards of one in four women in the United States is raped in her lifetime. And if you are a woman, you know that this statistic is low because going to the police is almost entirely fucking useless most of the time. Um, uh, only a very minuscule percentage of rapists ever see a day in jail, even when there is tangible evidence to prove it. Um, rape is every day terrorism against women. Unintended pregnancy is a metric of whether female people have access to the resources to make reproductive decisions and the allowance by their culture, or more specifically, the men who most likely run their culture to make those decisions for themselves. So when we look at unintended pregnancy, that's a rough metric of, of these factors, but it is a metric. And approaching half of all pregnancies worldwide are unintended. 
So this indicates that women globally have almost no access to reproductive autonomy. And we also have to remember that in the United States alone, an estimated 32,000 pregnancies a year are the result of rape. So that is both reproductive and sexual extraction, and now rapists can sue for custody rights. So the consummation of all of that. So sexual extraction from women's bodies has been a way of life for men in this culture since the beginning of this culture on this continent, since the first moment of colonization. And all the way up until today, where still indigenous women experience significantly higher rates of male violence in the general population. Reproductive extraction, too, has just as long and horrific a history on this continent, from women captured and enslaved being used as reproductive resources by their captors, to the present day where 87% of U.S. counties have no abortion provider, and that number is going up. The right to reproductive freedom is too expensive, frankly, for most women to afford. There's a class element there. And women of color are still routinely coercively sterilized within the prison system. Um, just last year it came out that um, upwards of 100 women in California uh, were forcibly sterilized. So these facts and figures are horrific, but they don't fully describe the experience of being female in a male supremacy, because misogyny is manifested in many different ways, from everyday humor to pornography, which is the propaganda of sex oppression, to the violence and contempt that women are routinely taught to feel and enact on our own bodies. Male supremacy means that male individuals are more likely to be able to attain positions of power, they're more likely to have their basic needs met, but what this also means is that cultures that are male supremacies are set up to prevent women from collectively resisting the conditions that we're forced to endure. Um, so from the pay gap to abortion criminalization to sexual and domestic slavery, which as we've just discussed is very prevalent, all the way up to foot binding and female genital mutilation, the institutions of male supremacy form the bars of the cage that restrain women from upsetting the hierarchy. So remember that image of a cage, and this is a long quote, but I'm going to read it all because Marilyn Fry has the best explanation of what oppression is that I've ever heard. She says, to consider a birdcage, if you look very closely at just one wire in the cage, you can't see the other wires. If your conception of what is before you is determined by this myopic focus, you could look at that one wire up and down the length of it and be unable to see why a bird couldn't fly around the wire anytime it wanted to go somewhere. Furthermore, even if one day at a time you inspected each wire, you still couldn't see why a bird would have trouble going past the wires to get anywhere. There is no physical property of any one wire, nothing that the closest scrutiny could discover that will reveal how a bird could be inhibited or harmed by it, except in the most accidental way. It's only when you step back, stop looking at the wires one by one, microscopically, and take a macroscopic view of the whole cage, that you can see why the bird doesn't go anywhere. And then you will see it in a moment. It will take no great subtlety of mental powers. It is perfectly obvious that the bird is surrounded by a network of systematically related barriers, no one of which would be the least hindrance to its flight, but which, by their relations to each other, are as confining as the solid walls of a dungeon. And this describes the institutions of male supremacy and how they interlock as well. So our intent, our intent this afternoon will be to show how these two destructive practices the practice of extracting resources from the earth and the practice of extracting resources from women are linked and how they feed one another and create a kind of perpetual motion machine of domination and destruction. A machine which has catastrophic consequences for both the land which supports all life and the class of humans we call women who are able to create human life. We will show the strong parallel which exists between the oppression and subordination of women in the dominant culture and the degradation of nature perpetuated by the dominant culture. And it's a subject, subject which gets very little attention, even at conferences which are centered around ecological concerns and in the environmental movement in general. This, of course, is a glaring omission. Most importantly, we will demonstrate that all oppression in the dominant culture is based on the extraction of resources which economically benefit the powerful. This is true whether we are speaking of the economic gains for oil tycoons, sweatshop owners, or as I like to call them, slave traders, or the men who traffic in the bodies of women and girls. All oppression has its base in resource extraction of some kind. Now here are some startling facts and figures for you. By 2048, most of the oceans and seas will be void of marine life. And that's because of the increasing acidification of the oceans. The triggering of 19 self-reinforcing feedback loops 
is predicted to result in near-term human extinction by as early as 2050. By 2047, New York City will experience life-altering climatic changes and become virtually uninhabitable. Los Angeles by 2048, London by 2056. And according to James Hansen, former NASA scientist, runaway global climate change is hurtling the planet towards a Venus-like future. And as you can see, the stakes could not be higher. But to understand where we are and where we're going, we need to understand where we've been. It hasn't always been like this. Humans have not always created ecocidal cultures, and humans have not always created male supremacist cultures, as we do now. So about 10,000 years ago, uh, the, prior to the mode of uh, social organizations that most humans live in now, the mode that we call civilization, humans had a very different relationship to the Earth. So what civilization? Let's talk about that. One definition can be the phenomena of people living in cities. Now, the word civilization comes from the Latin civilis, which means civil, and it relates to the Latin civis, which means citizen, and civitas, which means city or city-state. But the important theme here is the city. So that's essentially characterized as people living in large enough numbers that they require the routine importation of resources. And that's because they've denuded their own land base of those resources. Now, civilized agricultural cultures rapidly overshoot the land's carrying capacity in terms of population. So that means that they need more than the land where they live can provide. And the resources they need to survive have to come from somewhere else. Now, this means that the Ohlone, uh, on whose land I now live, in uh, Redwood City in California, were not civilized because they did not overshoot their carrying capacity. And so they did not require the routine importation of resources. So about 10,000 years ago, the earth was all common land. It wasn't private and it wasn't public. And although human and other groups did assert territoriality, um, the misuse of common land became very apparent very quickly because if you misused it, you either perished or you moved on. The eight million humans at that time lived in thousands of small society with as many distinctive ways of living on the earth for centuries and millennia. Now in contrast, the culture most predominant today on the planet today specializes in the destruction of land bases and the perpetuation of violence. By definition, civilization is violence, because if you require the routine importation of resources in order for your population to survive, you must necessarily be violent towards other cultures and peoples who have those resources. So it doesn't matter how peaceful and loving your people think they are, because if the people residing in the next watershed do not give you voluntarily their resources, you're going to take them by force or your population will die. Now, radicals identify the root causes of problems in order to overcome them and prevent their resurgence. Now, civilization is the process by which land bases are destroyed, resources are depleted, and violence is enculturated amongst its members. So, as such, we identify civilization as the primary threat to the planet. But the term civilization can be broken down further. And remember the birdcage of interlocking, uh, interlocking oppressions. It can be broken down in, as the interlocking systems of oppression that facilitate the extraction of resources from human and non-human animals and the planet itself. In conjunction with industrial extraction processes, the tendency towards overconsumption and violence is the violation imperative inherent in patriarchal and misogynist culture. Now, it's important to remember that civilization is simply the predominant culture of our time, but it's not the predominant culture in human history, as popular opinion would have you believe. And more than 90% of our existence on this planet, more than 90%, was spent in non-civilized cultures. Now, Homo sapiens reached anatomical modernity around 200,000 years ago, but our most immediate ancestors, Homo erectus, 
Uh, they arrived uh, around 1.9 million years ago. But in any case, the emergence of agriculture, which was the starting point of, uh, of civilized living, is only 10,000 years old. So misogyny and male supremacy, like civilization, are anything but eternal, and they do have traceable beginnings. In fact, the traceable beginnings of agricultural societies and civilization and patriarchy and male supremacist societies are intimately intertwined. These two systems develop together and in many cases codependent on each other. Um, civilized agricultural societies are patriarchal across the board, but prior to these extractive social arrangements, a significant number of non-industrialized cultures were not rape cultures. Some even organized their spiritualities and worldviews to be woman-centered. So again, contrary to popular opinion, God has not always been male. So Gerda Lerner is a historian and author, and she wrote the book, The Creation of Patriarchy, which really lays the groundwork for a lot of this history. In this book, Gerda asserts that patriarchy as we know it today is a historic creation that took nearly 2,500 years to form, um, and which is well established today. So she writes that the sexuality of women consisting of their sexual and reproductive capacities and services was commodified even prior to, Western, to the creation of Western civilization. It was the development of agriculture in the Neolithic period that fostered the intertribal exchange of women, not only as a means of avoiding warfare, because that traffic in women cemented alliances through marriage or um, sale, as it uh, originally was, um, but also because societies with more women could produce more children. And in contrast to the economic needs of hunting and gathering societies, agriculturalists could use the labor of children and the adults they would later become to increase the labor force um, and to increase production and accumulate surpluses. So agriculture developed concurrently with the early commodification of female bodies, their labor, and the products of their reproduction. Now, one of the most significant traceable convergences between the development of patriarchy and the development of civilization is the advent of agriculture. As the main means of sustaining the human population, agriculture should really be the focal point of any discussion of sustainability in the modern movement. But sadly, so much of our analysis is lacking in this regard. So as Jared Diamond put it, agriculture is the worst mistake in human history. But personally, I think Lear Keith explains it even more precisely. Simply put, you take a piece of land, and you clear every single living thing off of it. And I mean down to the bacteria. And then you plant that land exclusively to support humans. The earth and its natural tendencies are exactly opposite to agricultural practices. Whereas agriculture relies on destructive biotic cleansing processes that draw down the water table, erode soil, and destroy biodiversity, the earth persists on perennial polycultures not the annual monocrops of industrial farming. Time and again, anthropological evidence shows that the emergence of agriculture led to widespread shifts in the ways of living and relationships to land and people. Agricultural people are marked by increased warfare, poverty and destitution, sex inequality, and concentrations of resources towards the few at the expense of the many. In contrast, Subsistence cultures are generally marked by lower levels of sex inequality, vastly lower levels of pollution and resource depletion, and less warfare. Cultures that are willing to break the boundaries of the land in order to control and to extract are also willing to break the boundaries of women and girls in order to control and to extract. So with agricultural and civilized societies gaining momentum, males as a group started to have rights over females, which females as a group did not have over males. Women themselves became a resource, as they are today um, in many contexts, acquired by men much as the land was acquired by men. Women were exchanged or bought in marriages for the benefit of their families. Later, they were conquered or bought in slavery, where their sexual services were part of their labor, and their children were the property of their owners or masters. So that's sexual and reproductive exploitation that continues today. Um, Lerner says that in every known society, it was women of conquered tribes who were first enslaved, whereas men were killed. It was only after men had learned how to enslave the women of groups who could be defined as strangers that they learned how to enslave men of those groups and, later, subordinates from within their own societies. So Lerner goes on to state that the enslavement of women, which combined both racism and sexism, again, as it does today, is very much intertwined, 
was a precursor to the formation of classes and class oppression. Class differences were, at their very beginnings, expressed and constituted in terms of patriarchal relations. So, so class is not a separate construct from gender. Um, in contrast, what Lerner says is that class is expressed in what she calls genderic terms. So today's system of stereotypes called gender is directly descended from these early sex castes. Gender is a barrier, again remember that birdcage, that prevents women from escaping the global conditions of subordination that we're forced to endure. Um, for millions of women and girls in countries all over the world, including the United States, as much as we do not like to think about it, sexual slavery and forced labor are gender norms. Those are feminine norms because they are forced onto females. Um, in the United States, even the minority of girls who are luckily spared physical and sexual violence within their lifetimes grew up convicted and convinced of their status as sexual objects or domestic workers or reproductive hosts, as a lovely congressman of ours recently described us. This is what gender is. This is what gender does. From birth, people born female are socialized into subordinate roles intended to facilitate sexual, economic, and reproductive extraction. It isn't natural or inevitable, and it hasn't gotten any less oppressive in the last 10,000 years. So we have Android Dworkin, woman is not born, she is made. In the making, her humanity is destroyed. She becomes symbol of this, symbol of that, mother of the earth, slut of the universe, but she never becomes herself because it's forbidden for her to do so. So we begin to see, this is a list we're gonna revisit throughout the presentation, how are misogyny and ecocide connected? Well, for a start, they develop concurrently and in many ways codependently. Agriculture depended on the extraction of labor from women and on the extraction of children from female bodies to grow the labor force. The subordinate status of women was, in turn, derived from their subjugation through forced labor, sex, and reproduction in the service of agriculture. So we really can't ignore this parallel. It's just too strong between the extraction of resources from the land and the extraction of resources from the female population. So globally, not a lot has changed since the second millennium BC. In Mesopotamian societies, the daughters of the poor were sold into marriages or into prostitution in order to advance the economic interests of their families. The daughters of wealthy men of property could command a bride price or a dowry, and uh, that would be paid by the family of the groom to the family of the bride. And this frequently enabled the bride's family to elevate their social and their economic status. This system of woman exchange, which, was, uh, which is a term coined by Levi Strauss, is still very much the norm in populations in India and Pakistan. Now, I know that there are other countries which also practice this, but I'm speaking about those two because I'm familiar by heritage with those two cultures, and I have close and personal experience of the systems and how they operate. So the first gender-defined social role for women in civilized agricultural societies was to be those who were exchanged in marriage transactions. Now the adverse gender role for males was to be those who did the exchanging, or more significantly, those who defined the terms of the exchange. Now another gender-defined role for women was that of what I call the stand-in wife, and that later becomes established and institutionalized for women of elite groups. Now later that role was sanctified by religion and came to be a position that women aspired to, as I think many women still aspire to today. This role gave those women, the wives, um, considerable power and privileges, but that power and privilege depended on their attachment to elite men and was based, at least in some part, on their satisfactory performance in rendering to these men sexual and reproductive services. And Lerner agrees, she says, if a woman failed to meet these demands, she was quickly replaced and thereby lost all her privileges and standing. The gender-defined role of warrior led men to acquire power over men and women of conquered tribes. Such war-induced conquest usually occurred over people already differentiated from the victors by race, ethnicity, or simple tribal difference. Now, in its ultimate origin, difference as a distinguishing mark between the conquered and the conquerors was based on the first clearly observable difference, and that's the difference between the sexes. And once men had learned how to assert and exercise power over people slightly different from themselves in the exchange of women, they were able 
to take that and extend the different, of difference of any kind uh, into a criterion for dominance and subjugation of the other. This is the same ideology that allows civilized humans to classify non-humans, people of color, and the earth itself as alien others ripe for domination and exploitation. So from this history, we can observe that from its inception in slavery, class dominance took different forms for enslaved males and females. Males were primarily exploited as workers. Females were always exploited as workers, but in addition, as providers of sexual services and for their capacity um, regarding reproduction. Um, Lerner shows this very thoroughly in her work. The historical record of every slave society offers evidence to make this generalization. So the sexual exploitation of lower class women by upper class men can be shown throughout civilized history under feudalism in the bourgeois households of 19th and 20th century Europe, in the sex-race relations between women of colonized countries and their male colonizers, in the distinct uptick in trafficking in teenage girls that goes on around the Super Bowl and the Olympics and other male-dominated sporting events and places where men gather. Um, it's exactly the same today and it has intensified. So it's ubiquitous and it's pervasive. For women, sexual exploitation is the mark of class exploitation. And Lerner corroborates this. At any given moment in history, each class is constituted into two distinct classes, men and women. The class position of women became consolidated and actualized through their sexual relationships. It was always expressed within limited degrees of freedom on a spectrum ranging from, as Saba described, the slave woman whose sexual and reproductive capacity was commodified as she herself, as her entirety was, um, to the slave concubine whose sexual performance might elevate her status or that of her children, then to the free wife whose sexual and reproductive services to one man of the upper classes entitled her to property and legal rights that she could only obtain through her relationship to her husband. So while each of these groups has vastly different privileges and obligations with regard to economics and law um, and property, they share the oppression of being sexually and, reproductive control, sexually and reproductively controlled by men. And this specific exploitation happens to females because they are female. Um, Lerner says that class for men was and is based on their relationship to the means of production. Um, those who owned the means of production could dominate those who did not. The owners of the means of production also acquired the commodity of female sexual services, both from women of their own class and from women of the subordinate classes. In ancient Mesopotamia, in classical antiquity, and in slave societies, dominant males also acquired as property the product of the reproductive capacity of subordinate women and children, to be worked, traded, married off, or sold as slaves as the case might be. For women, class is mediated through sexual ties to a man. So if the conclusions we're drawing from this history seem extreme to you, or if the fact that we're referencing ancient Mesopotamia makes it seem far removed from what female people experience today globally, let me remind you of some facts. First off, uh, again, women produce a higher percentage of the food through labor extraction. This is still true. Additionally, women make up more than 80% of the world's domestic workers. Add to this that women across the board, some people call it the mommy tax or you know, whatever else sort of popular culture, in that women are still saddled with the invisible and unending work of housework and reproduction and that this is the norm. Um, so the realities of this disparity are also racialized. Again, hearkening back to the idea of people being separated into classes in order to facilitate the extraction of resources. Because female domestic and agricultural workers to provide to an industrialized country like the US are virtually exclusively women of color and immigrant women. The classist, racist, male supremacist power dynamic that marked early agricultural societies has not shifted as much as we would like to think it has. It has just intensified and changed form. So today, male ownership of land has led to a dominator culture of patriarchy manifesting itself in food export, overgrazing, exploitation of people, and an abusive land ethic in which animals and land are only valued as economic resources, as are women. The degradation of nature contributes to the degradation of women. Thomas Slater and D. Rochelau uh, in Gender, Environment, and Development in Kenya, a grassroots perspective, detail how in Kenya, the capitalist-driven export economy has caused most of the agriculturally productive land to be used for monoculture cash crops. This led to an intensification of pesticide use, resource depletion, 
and relocation of subsistence farmers, especially women, to the hillsides and less productive land, where their deforestation and cultivation led to soil erosion, furthering the environmental degradation that hurts their own productivity. As usual, women are hit the hardest when their land is stolen and destroyed. A Marxist feminist perspective places women at the most unfortunate end of the capitalist production process. By casting women in nature as an unfeeling, alien other, male dominance is ensured and enduring practices of exploitation take root. This historically continuous strengthening of the system of domination eventually asserted itself in the third world in the form of cash crops. And through this economic improvement, so-called, the oppression of women, indigenous people, and the natural world will continue to grow in developing nations. Now, demonstrating the connected oppression of women and nature is relatively simple in the case of cash crops, as it involves most of these points. Through the pressure of a global economy, the cash crop overturns sustenance farming and forests. Under development and third world debt, widen from this economic imperialism, bringing industrialization as a so-called solution. Food production and distribution are disrupted and reformulated to place both men and profits above women and the integrity of the ecosystem. Now presently, approximately 7 billion humans inhabit the earth. And patriarchal multinationals, government bureaucracies, and the militaries of a few countries assert sovereignty over the rest of the world. They dispute all claims of common land. Based mainly in the northern industrialized countries of the planet, these organizations have been and continue to destroy our life support systems. They control almost all of the organized forces of violence in the world. They also control technologies, equipment, and payrolls. And according to the World Bank, International financial institutions have resources of over $20 trillion. That's about the same as the total gross national product of the entire world. Governments have no control over their economies when capital of this magnitude can enter and leave at will. These patriarchies also control most of the education systems and other mass media through which they promote mass destruction. And these efforts are legitimized by using such labels as development, jobs, national security, nuclear power, nation building, social progress, border security, eradicating drugs and traffic, terrorists, tribals, insurgents, and exploding populations. On the topic of population, we sometimes hear about this sort of abstractly described population explosion, which does relate to what Saba was talking about um, beginning with civilized cultures overshooting their land base, but the origins of this are talked about very um, little, and I find that disturbing. So in a self-reinforcing feedback loop of extraction, um, the worldwide population explosion, and the effects of the resource extraction necessary to sustain these populations are almost entirely consequences of patriarchal societies in which men exercise and promote their traditional and legal rights to torment, impregnate, abandon, and or murder women. So, as I said at the beginning, approaching half of all pregnancies globally are unintended by the woman who is becoming pregnant. Um, reproductive extraction is a form of resource extraction. I would argue that it's one of the primary forms of resource extraction and it deserves a lot more attention. Um, sex and reproduction are not under women's control. And that's something that if you have ever been involved in reproductive rights or justice activism in the United States, you know very well. Um, so this shouldn't really come as a surprise, however, because sexual and reproductive extraction have been part of this country's history since the first colonizers crossed the ocean. Rape has been a weapon of war in every war between civilized countries, and more notably and horrifically between civilized countries and the indigenous cultures that they must displace in order to keep their populations growing. So this weapon is still being used today against indigenous women who have significantly higher rates of sexual assault, murder, and trafficking than the general population. And even more telling, indigenous women are more likely to be raped by someone outside their own culture than by someone within their culture. And this is a terrifying reality that women in no other racial group share with them. Reproductive extraction, too, stains the entire litany of colonization and expansion that defines United States history. 
Beginning in the 1600s, captured African women sold as slaves were not only sold into brutal forced labor, they were sold because they had the capacity to be raped and impregnated and grow that labor force. That wasn't accidental, it was intentional. Um, they were made profitable in terms of sex and reproduction as well as labor. So if you hark back to eighth grade history class and think about manifest destiny and westward expansion, usually cast in a very rosy light, um, you know, we, we don't really hear about the fact that this was fueled by a racist panic that minority populations would overtake the white population and challenge male supremacy. Um, and this thought still sends explicit shivers down the spines of our white male leaders of government and industry. Um, this was the advent of abortion criminalization in the United States. So I want to quote a prominent anti-abortion crusader of that era of Manifest Destiny. Um, he's a physician, Horatio R. Story, and he asked, Will the West be filled by our own children or by those of aliens? This is a question our women must answer. Upon their loins depends the future destiny of the nation. By our women, he means white women, white Protestant women. Unfortunately, Storer and his fellow physicians and their friends in the government were not satisfied to leave that answer up to women or our loins. They decided to take it into their own hands. Um, so the first law is criminaliz criminalizing abortion and thereby aiding the extraction of reproductive resources from female bodies appeared on the books during this time. And it's all been downhill from there. More laws in the United States controlling reproduction and restricting female reproductive autonomy have been passed in the last three years than in the last ten. So this is not anything new, and it's not anything that we're unfamiliar with. Even our deepest held beliefs and worldviews have been infected by the ideology of extraction. Um, another strain of this is the uh, sort of biblical directive of man's right to dominion over nature and woman. And we can see this particularly historically in the switch from female deities to male. Um, I'm specifically talking about the Judeo-Christian tradition because it's very prominent, but also it's because I am familiar with that one. Um, the female religious role models of my youth included Mary, who, of course, though not a deity herself, was lucky enough, blessed enough, to be forcibly impregnated by her God. Um, she, uh, the extraction of God's son from Mary's womb was heralded by the angel Gabriel as a miracle, and Mary was grateful to have served as an extraction site, or at least that's how the male authors of the good book tell it. So with cultural myths like these, why is it any wonder that reproductive extraction has been a way of life for powerful European men on this continent since the beginning? Why is it any wonder that the powerful Catholic lobby has no trouble convincing the government to deny women birth control? They want birth control, all right, but only if they or their gods are the one doing it, never women. So here's another parallel um, between ecocide and misogyny. Both are perpetuated through violation and the breaking of boundaries. Rape and for forced birth break women's boundaries and ignore their refusal. Species extinction and the everyday death of entire ecosystems that we've become inured to happens because the boundaries of the land are also ignored in the service of resource extraction. So, patriarchal multinationals and governments and militaries, they've acquired unprecedented power and pay. Um, that, sorry, they pay at least 100 million of their employees to do the hands-on work of destroying and poisoning the Earth's habitat. It's by logging, bombing, spraying, incinerating, extracting, burying, dumping, and so on. Those involved in the hands-on work of destruction of our life support systems, they do their jobs more completely and effectively by using machines which are powered by the extraordinary energy subsidies embedded in fossil fuels and by creating, using, and broadcasting substances against which the natural world has no defense. They do it for money. And they really do need that money because nearly all of the commons of the earth have been privately appropriated. Billions of people, women being hit hardest, as usual, are desperate to do anything for money because they've been forced into a position where they can't survive without selling their labor or their bodies entire to the powerful. And on the macro level, the powerful are those in control of male-dominated institutions like militaries, multinational corporations, and governments. This same dynamic filters down to the micro level as individual men benefit from male supremacy. So without understanding that men's oppression of women is rooted in a sex caste system, 
that extracts resources from females, one is hard pressed to mount an effective resistance to that oppression that can bring about fundamental change. Like a virus, misogyny morphs and changes to evade our attempts to resist it. Today, even the word feminism itself has been co-opted by the sex industry. So, Sheila Jeffries, a feminist writer, says, the sexual revolution actually represents adjustments in the forces of male supremacy. Male power was bolstered by conscripting women into sexual intercourse and orchestrating their sexual response so that they would eroticize their own subordination. The revolutions or adjustments in male supremacist techniques of control were conducted in the name of science and health, but using the rhetoric of liberalism. So the so-called sexual revolution of the 1960s in the US, while it's been portrayed in retrospect as resistance to male supremacy, it was in actuality a new and different packaging for male supremacy. This is even more obvious when we consider where this supposed revolution has led us today. While a few women in rich countries get to celebrate the supposed empowerment of individual choice to participa participate in commodified sex, girls in poverty the world over are born into a caste of sexual slavery, and that spans the globe. Now, Gail Dines, one of my favorite people, author, professor, and anti-porn activist, she says, the buzzword in popular feminism today is empowerment. When I became a feminist many years ago, the word we used was liberation. Unlike empowerment, liberation is a collective concept, imagine that, which means that even if my life is all rosy and empowered, it doesn't mean shit for those women who are doing low paid jobs or trying to raise families. In fact, there's a very good chance that elite women's empowerment is built on the backs of other women whose exploited labor provides the goods and services that enable a good career and a comfortable lifestyle. The low pay of nannies, cooks, cleaners, sweatshop workers, and daycare providers means that wealthier women are freed up to make a salary that no doubt does feel empowering. So, got some, uh, some numbers here for you. Now, all of these come from uh, a website called worsethanyouthink.org. Now, this is a website that is, they, this organization exclusively gathered data on human trafficking and their numbers are used by the YWCA, by Not For Sale, and by the Global Human Resource Center for Human Trafficking. Now, it's a matter of fact that only 10% of all trafficked persons are from industrialized nations, so like America. and 50% uh, though of the worldwide profits from this slavery are made by industrialized nations. So this means that overwhelmingly it's the wealthy nations which are profiting from the sexual slavery and trafficking of relatively poor women and girls. And within the US, that's an estimated 100,000 children are domestic victims of sex trafficking. And 82% of those children are adolescent girls between the ages of 12 and 16. The profits made by, the global profit made by this trafficking is $31.6 billion. It's $31.6 billion. That's the largest profits. More than 15 billion US dollars are made from people trafficked and forced to work in industrialized countries. And it's the quickest, it's the most, uh, it's the biggest expanding and quickest growing um, illegal uh, trade, apart from the drug trade. It's going to overtake the drug trade, they say, in the next five years, I believe, the profits of it. So while this industry expands exponentially, and while governments aid this expansion by changing existing protections to allow more trafficking, um, defenses of trafficking as sex work, as it's often euphemized, completely ignore the experiences of women of color and indigenous women who bear the brunt of this brutality. In response to Canada's recent decision to allow an even greater increase in instances of trafficking, um, an organization called Indigenous Women Against the Sex Industry, which is based in British Columbia, I believe, um, released a statement, and this is an excerpt from it. They said, as indigenous women and girls who have experienced centuries of colonial male violence, the decision by the Supreme Court of Canada to strike down the existing prostitution laws comes as no surprise. 
Our histories, our laws and traditions, and our worldviews have been purposefully omitted from the Supreme Court decision. Once again, not only our voices, but our bodies and our lives have been dismissed as inconsequential. This is resource extraction. There's no other way to put it. These numbers clearly demonstrate what Jeffries and so many other feminist scholars are saying and have been saying for decades while we ignore them. What we label empowerment is really just an adjustment of male supremacist hegemony. What we're looking at, instead of the empowerment and revolution of sexual expression as it's so heavily touted, is a culture in which sexual slavery and male domination of women is the norm. Um, it's not only a, an unspoken norm. This entire culture can, encourages, supports, funds, and distributes blatant violence against women. And that violence is euphemized into empowerment, choice, and agency for a few at the expense of the many. So we see again another strong connection here between misogyny and ecocide. Both are based upon, could not exist without, the sale of living beings for profit. From early woman exchange systems, to the marketing of the land, air, and water, to the gut-wrenching extent of sexual slavery for women and girls today, to the wholesale buying and selling of ecosystems and communities by multinationals globally. All of this depends on the idea that living beings, female people, entire species, are objects to be bought, used, and sold. In a culture which coerces women into work that degrades and violates them, there is no real choice for them. There can be no choice within coercion. And since there is no genuine choice, there is no genuine empowerment. Poverty, theft of land and resources, limiting women's ability to make meaningful choices and leaving them with options which reinforce the underlying ideology of the culture. That is, that women exist for sexual exploitation and that some women choose this of their own free will. This is coercion. The sex industry is an industry no less destructive and toxic than the fossil fuel industry. And this is what happens when we allow the tendencies and the paradigms of industry to steer the direction of our movements. Now, most attempts to address the ongoing disasters of climate change, species extinction, and resource drawdown have similarly only served to further enculturate this system of destruction. Now, liberals emphasize the individual as a primary unit of social change. They believe that if individual persons change their thinking and change their behavior, that entire systems can be altered. Alternately, radicals understand that while it is important for individuals to actively work to live and behave in sustainable ways, ultimately, it's not the individual who changes oppressive systems. Rather, it is in the class. The class is the primary unit of social change. People who share a common oppression and join together to combat it. Liberals believe that oppression is somehow a mistake a result of well-meaning, if only misguided people who can be convinced through moral appeal. But if this were true, surely the hundreds of examples of liberal appeals to oppressive systems would have yielded substantial results already. We know this to be false. Radicals acknowledge that oppression is not a mistake, and it is not simply a misunderstanding. Oppression is the result of concrete institutions of power that facilitate the extraction of resources and labor from people, animals, and the planet, and that place acquisition, privilege, and comfort over life itself. So when liberals focus solely on in-consumer choices that only address individual behavior, they do a great disservice to the movement and the planet. Recycled toilet paper has yet to slow the rate of deforestation. High efficiency light bulbs have not put a dent in the extraction and burning of fossil fuels. Voting with your dollars is not an effective response because it takes the industrial economy as a given. We cannot fix the problems of extraction with more of the same. It's not the products that are the problem. It's the process of production and industry itself. It is the industry itself that commodifies a living community as resources to be extracted rather than living beings with whom to develop relationship. So we, if we allow business to tell us that solar panels are green alternatives to fossil fuels, guess what? They get, to keep, they get to continue to mine for rare minerals, copper, and other metals necessary for their production. The reformism of green energy, like the reformism of the pro-prostitution lobby, completely ignores the perspective of indigenous communities. Solar panels and wind turbines still require industrialism, still require the mining of rare earth minerals, and still threaten to displace and destroy ecosystems in indigenous communities. 
when we allow sustainability advocates to preach the wonders of biofuels and wind turbines, we get more destroyed land bases and more massacred birds and bats. When we allow the tendencies and the paradigms of industry to steer the direction of our movements, the results we achieve are more of the same. And I'm going to show these stats for you again, as harrowing as they are, and I'm also going to give you the sources for them. By 2048, most of the oceans and seas will be void of marine life, and that's according to the journal Science. According to TransitionVoice.com, the triggering of 19 self-reinforcing feedback loops is predicted to result in near-term human extinction by the year 2050. By 2047, New York City could be uninhabitable. LA by 2048, and London by 2056. And according to James Hansen, a former NASA scientist, runaway global climate change is hurling the planet towards a Venus-like future. Now, how are misogyny and ecocide connected? Neither can be reformed. Both must be dismantled entirely if women, if our communities, or if life on Earth itself are going to have a chance at survival. So, if you had really fully accepted this future is inevitable, you probably wouldn't bother to come to a conference like this one. You're here because you know that extraction being perpetrated against the Earth is killing the planet. You're here because you know that no other life is possible on a dead planet. You're here because on some level you know, even if you haven't ever heard it articulated, that all extractive processes must immediately cease. This is not negotiable. The industrial economy and every step in its process is unsustainable and it's killing the planet and oppressing living communities. Our only chance is changing that future is organized, political resistance. So what do we mean by organized political resistance? We mean to say that we need to start thinking and acting and organizing like a real serious resistance movement. We're going to have to identify the weak points of industrial infrastructure and attack it until it can't, can no longer operate. That's right, I said we're going to have to attack it. We will have to recruit those with the skills and the passion to contribute however they can. And we will have to create and sustain new cultures based on real sustainability, community, and solidarity. Our resistance will be political and must engage with the politics and the processes of industrial capitalism. So that means that it has to recognize that this is a class struggle. We're fighting against a relatively small group of highly privileged and class conscious people who consciously work together to ensure their own best interests and the interests of industry and capital. So we too will have to think and behave in a class conscious manner, working together to ensure the best interest of living communities. Now our actions in defense of the land must be strategic. That is, our actions must be placed within the larger goals and vision of the movement. Now, some of our actions will help to sustain the movement. For instance, community gardens and skill sharing networks that support movement workers. But others have to take more decisive action, such as militant attacks on oil and natural gas infrastructure. That's right, militant attacks. Understanding the difference between the two is important because we need it all. At every level of analysis, whether it be nonviolent or militant, liberal or radical, there is important work to be done, and this work is happening all over the world. Building a culture of resistance that can effectively challenge power is not a task for children or for the immature. We need mature, passionate warriors serving on the front lines, putting their bodies and lives on the line in defense of the planet. We need a strict firewall between the above ground and underground movements so we can ensure the safety of everyone. And we all must be willing to do whatever it takes to bring down the industrial infrastructure. We need the same level of dedication toward bringing down patriarchy. And we need it to not be an afterthought as it's been in every, almost every group I've ever been a part of. Um, as we hopefully demonstrated, it's not possible to disentangle the murder and the brutalization and the genocide of the planet with the murder and the brutalization and the genocide of women. Both are in the service of resource extraction and both cannot continue. 
Men beat and kill women because violence is what keeps the system of male supremacy in place. Industrial civilization is killing the planet because men profit from ecocide. Control is the fundamental structure of this culture. To extract resources from women, men use violence to control them. To extract resources from the planet, men running corporations and governments use violence to control living communities. The misogynist culture attacks women's bodies, their environments, their communities, their perceptions, and their relationships. When it's easy to violate each other, it's easy to violate everything else. And nothing is spared, not even genes and atoms. Robert Jensen um, is an author who writes on this topic, and he says that pornography is what the end of the world looks like. He calls it the end of empathy. When you're trained from childhood to suppress empathy and glorify force and violation, in addition to gaining benefits and reward for doing so, the otherwise unthinkable acts of violence and destruction that women live with every day become routine. A random selection of 304 scenes from the most rented pornographic films of 2005, things have become worse since then, yielded that 89.8% .8 of them contain instances of aggression, and 94.4% of that aggression was directed at women. When this is the culture that male people are raised within, you end up with an entire class of people whose collective behavior is fundamentally at odds with the continuation of life on the planet. Now, if you're a man and you cringe when you hear these words, good, you should. <laughs> men, men have to stop running from the reality and face the truth. We need to undergo some serious transformation. The base tendencies inherent in our socialization, what becomes our sense of self, our way of being, are rooted in hate and violence. This is the kind of world we live in, one in which women live in fear, terrorized by violent men, and one in which every living community is under attack from industries largely owned and operated by men. We need to start asking ourselves some serious questions. What does it mean to be a man? What behaviors are present in conceptions of masculinity that are not present in conceptions of basic goodness? When we talk about men, we're referring to men as a class. Oftentimes, we men get defensive because surely I haven't been oppressive to women. We immediately individualize what is actually an observation of men's collective behavior. And that's an attempt to escape responsibility for our part. In a patriarchal culture, every man retains some sexist beliefs and behaviors. And every man benefits from and has a responsibility to dismantle women's oppression. Now, whether or not individual men articulate or consciously idealize some hatred of women, our behavior reflects that reality. And our behavior perpetuates a woman-hating culture. Now, privileged classes will protect their privilege. Men will continue to terrorize women, and industry will continue to destroy land bases unless they are stopped. Oppression is intentional, and its intent is to secure and protect privilege and power. It's not a mistake, it's not a misunderstanding. It's a war. And there are plenty of misogynists who will tell you just that. So it's gonna take more than good intentions. It's gonna take more than our claims of being good men. We have to give our allegiance to women and the planet. We have to start holding each other accountable for our sexist behavior and defending women when we're asked to do so, not when we feel like playing a hero. It's not easy, of course. It's, this is not easy work, okay? Patriarchal culture affects everything we do, and so it will take a lot of work to root out these tendencies. But that work is not negotiable. It must be done. And we know most men won't do it, but fortunately, some of us will. Some will. I hate to bring us down, but if you're a woman and an organizer, you know that most won't. Um, we need to marshal our collective power as people oppressed by sex oppression, as females, to form organized political resistance to patriarchal and misogyny, and that's the only thing that's ever going to help. Um, Janice Berklin is an eco-feminist writer, and she has this quote, which I think is illustrative. Focus on changing our anthropocentric way of experiencing or perceiving nature is inadequate, either as an analysis or a program of action. While human supremacy must be overcome, it cannot be overcome without addressing male-centeredness and patriarchy. 
The overall goal is to reassess our relationship with the natural world and see anthropocentrism as a symptom of a deeper patriarchy in the dominant culture that needs to be deconstructed before a successful ethic can be produced. And in the words of Andrea Dworkin, feminism is the political practice of fighting male supremacy on behalf of women as a class. And that's a great quote. And I'm going to give you some examples of women around the world who are doing just that. So I want to end on, you know, people like to end on a positive note. So um, there's women engaged in that work all over the world. And we're going to look at just two really different approaches. Now, this is one of my favorite women in the world. Her name is Asma Jahangir. And I have been lucky enough to work with her in the 90s. Now, she's from Pakistan. And for the past three decades, Asma and her sister Hina Jalani, they have been at the forefront of both women's and human rights movements. They've both been subject to 24-hour-a-day surveillance by the state since 1996. It hasn't stopped them. In 1980, they helped to found the Women's Action Forum, WAF, which is where I uh, found them and helped them while I was in Pakistan. And this forum came about as a result of the Evidence Act that was passed in 1980 by Pakistan. And it's more uh, well known as the Hadood Ordinance. And what that did to Ria law that come, uh, that's from Islam. And so it severely curtailed women's ability to uh, give testimony in a court of law. It meant that one, they, for, for every one man's testimony, you needed two women. So women's testimony was worth half of men's. Now they, they formed WAF as a, as a response to this, and it mainly helps, well it actually only helps, poor women obtain divorces from abusive husbands. It's, in 1981, they founded the first all-women's law firm in Pakistan, and in 1986, they founded the Pakistani Human Rights Commission. And Hina Jalani still serves as a chair on that. Now, these, this is an excellent example of women with privilege because they both come from uh, wealthy families and they were educated. But they use that privilege to serve those, to exclusively serve those women who have much less privilege and much less power than they do. And here's a quote from Asma Jahangir to... Uh, young women lawyers in Pakistan at a forum that she was uh, speaking at, she said, you are fighting with your pen. You are fighting with the instruments of law against a power with a gun, a power that does not recognize the law. And I want to just say that both Asma and Hina Jalani have been recipients of constant death threats, incarceration, and they both have their houses bombed by religious extremists. None of this has stopped them from doing the work that they have devoted their lives to, and in particular, in inspiring other young women to engage in the same work. So now here's another example from India, and it's a completely different example. This is uh, the famous, or somewhat famous, Gulabi Gang, or the Pink Sari Gang, and they started a campaign to end male violence in India. And so, they organized to form this uh, Gulabi Gang to physically retaliate against men who hurt women. And their campaigns have been massively effective. The Gulabi Gang is estimated to have about 20,000 members across northern India, and they've even now got a chapter in Paris, France. <laughs> and the group's founder, Sampat Pal Devi, she said, we have managed to stop women being raped and sent girls to school. Violence and rape against women is very common here, so we're trying to educate them so that they know their rights. In cases of domestic violence, we go and talk to the man and explain why it's wrong. If he refuses to listen, we get the woman out of the house, and then we beat him. <laughs> if, if necessary, we do this in public to embarrass him. Men used to think the law didn't apply to them that we are forcing a huge change. Another Gulabi gang member says, on my own, I have no rights, but together as the Gulabi gang, we have power. Now, that's 
and it, you know, a comparison between both groups, the, the WAF and also the Gulabi Gang, is they have marshaled collective power to fight male supremacy. I also wanted to mention that in Eugene, my best friend started a group called Warrior Sister Society that is attempting to do a similar thing. We provide free self-defense. We recently got off the ground to provide free self-defense to women who need it with particular focus on vulnerable populations like homeless women. So that's something I'm really proud of and I just want to um, you know, small plug for the U.S. that we're not completely useless or trying not to be. <laughs> so I'm also going to give you a couple of examples of, of resistance against the expansion of industrial culture. And the Tarleton people celebrated a decision last year in 2013 by Fortune Minerals, and they halted mineral exploration activities on Clapham Mountain inside the sacred headwaters region of northern British Columbia, Canada. Now this decision to halt the extraction came after several bold actions, which was led by club owner keepers. And they started with the delivery of an eviction notice, they escalated to a blockade, and then they escalated it even further by taking over the drilling site. Another inspiring story from 2013, the Sami people, has stepped forward to defend an area of great spiritual and cultural importance to them. Walking alongside a group of non-indigenous activists, the Sami set up a roadblock to stop the UK-based mining company Bill Wolf, which was planning to carry out a drilling program in the area known as Kalak, which in Sami is known as Galog. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. The blockade was dismantled and on several occasions, apparently, but that did not deter them from continuing to defend the land. And ultimately, the Sami and their allies were victorious and they prevented the wolf from moving ahead. Now we can see acts of resistance growing from the Unistoten camp, which is a community acting as a blockade of the Pacific Trails pipeline and a reclamation of native sovereignty from Canada, we can see acts of resistance from MEND in Nigeria, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, which is a militant force of a few hundred, and they have reduced, they've managed to reduce oil output from their region by almost a third. And it's about time that we started seeing serious acts of resistance right here in the US. Unless we understand that the dominant culture is not only hierarchical, but patriarchal, not only anthropocentric, but androcentric, then the social origins of the current ecological catastrophe will be overlooked. Unless we make the connection that the subjugation of Earth and the subjugation of females as a class cannot be disentangled from each other, we will not be successful in fighting either of them, and we will forfeit the planet in the process. This is why militarism is a feminist issue, this is why rape is an environmental issue, and it's why environmental destruction is an anti-racist issue, but making that connection is nowhere near enough. We need organization, we need strategy, we need to materially, physically halt the extraction of resources from female bodies in order to grant women the right to a future free of exploitation. We need to physically halt the extraction of resources from the earth, especially fossil fuels, if we want there to be a future of all for any of us, at all for any of us. The last and most important parallel between misogyny and ecocide is that they both can and must be fought. Thank you. <laughs>